Thank you, Roxana, and thank you, uh, Samin. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, this is a very good forum. I have, uh, I'll talk about the stroke after TAVR. I have only one conflict that I am a co-PI for the new uh, Sentinel trial for the Claret device. If you look at the uh, initial part of the TAVR, the first editorial that came from Dr. Shaf from Mayo Clinic uh, was to say uh, that uh, there is increased risk of stroke and this is the penalty to pay. What I'm going to try to convince you that it is exactly the opposite, that the stroke is probably better with TAVR uh, compared to surgery. It is a, absolutely a reverse paradigm uh, that uh, I'll try to convince you that that is probably the case, probably. So if you look at the uh, partner trial data, uh, initially we got a 5% uh, stroke rate in the cohort B, then in the cohort A, the highest surgical patients was 3.7 percent, and then in a continued access registry, it was 3.7 percent, 2.1 percent from 6.8 with a transapical. So big de decrease in the transapical, not so big decrease in the transfemoral, but remember that initially we did not uh, systematically study stroke in the non randomized uh, continued access registry, we had a systematic stroke analysis. So these patients are probably less stroke, uh, but it turns out uh, that actually it is the same. If you look at, we did this meta-analysis to look at the stroke feasibility trials. We got exactly same result, 5% stroke rate uh, with uh, all feasibility trials. And if you compare TF versus TA, uh, Initially, there was some, uh, some uh, contention that the TA will have less strokes, but exactly the same, 2.8 versus 2.9%. If you look at the 30-day uh, stroke rate with the Edward Sapien valve or uh, with Medtronic valve, exactly the same, 3.1 versus 2.5%. And if you look at the single center studies, so these were all major registries I showed you. Now you're looking at single center studies reported. Again, 3.4 versus 3.8 with TF and TA. And if you look at single center registries uh, with uh, Edwards and, uh, and Medtronic Val, it is 3.2 and 3.8%. So very, very similar number, uh, about 3% stroke rate uh, in both of the trials. If you look at the surgery, now what is the deal with the surgery? Is it the surgical stroke risk much less than this, or it is equal, or, or what is the real reality uh, with the surgical stroke rate? So the one comparative study, which initially was the partner trial, unfortunately in the partner trial, uh, there was no neurological assessment that was required, because this was before the stroke became a problem. So this was all, unfortunately, a retrospective analysis. We had to go back to each chart and determine if the patient had a stroke or not. So whatever things were available to us, that's how people determine there's no neurologist to assess the stroke uh, on a routine basis. And here if you look at 4.4% in the uh, TAVR group and 2.6% in the surgical group, and this created this notion that surgery is much better than TAVR in terms of stroke. Corval study came out, and Corval study had a neurological assessment in each patient, and the neuro neurologist systematically assessed the stroke, and now we came back with this idea, 6.2 versus 4.9% stroke, but the 6.2 was in surgery, and 4.9 was in TAVR. So actually, the TAVR stroke rate was a little bit less than surgical stroke rate. So where do we reside? Is the surgical stroke rate 6.2% or is surgical stroke rate 2.4%? Is this a variability in surgeons or is it variability in understanding reporting? Because two studies were very differently conducted. If you look at the surgical literature, it is 4.4% stroke rate that was reported by four major institutions uh, by we know uh, in the high-risk patients. However, this is a very good paper, I think worth reading from circulation that was recently published from UPenn, uh, from the two hospitals in UPenn. And 196 patients underwent TAVR, I'm sorry, surgical AVR, and out of these 196 patients, they studied their stroke risk. And if you look at the stroke risk, there was 34 patients who had stroke. 34 patients had symptomatic stroke. Seven, four patients had TIA, so the stroke risk surgical stroke risk was 17%. And if you look at this, the post-operative days and, and, uh, and, uh, and the NIH stroke scales, uh, you can see that there are many of them are minor strokes, but it is still 
17% uh, stroke rate. If you look at whatever literature you want to look at in surgery, isolated AVR, 2.4%, 3.7%, 1.5%, 2.7%, nobody talks anything more than 10%. And if you look at this one study where the multi-wall procedures were done, they said 97 But again, nothing to go to more than 10%. What is the difference? So this is the same, same subset of patients, 34 patients. Uh, out of 34 patients, how many patients were reported to uh, STS database. Same, this is UPAN. Uh, 34 patients, only 13 patients were reported to the STS database as having stroke. The rest of the patients, the surgeons did not feel that they had strokes and they were not reported as having strokes. And out of the 13 patients, only nine by neurologist had stroke. So four patients, one had alcohol withdrawal, other three, the neurologist didn't think that had a stroke. So inaccuracy was tremendous. That out of 34 patients, nine are now reported, uh, correctly reported, and four are incorrectly reported. But if you look at the, the stroke rate, it will be obviously very different if you report th 13 versus 34 patients out of 196 patients. And there are a lot of asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, patients. Now, if you look at subclinical, subclinical strokes, both TAVR and surgical AVR has very similar volumes, very similar MRIs, if you look at systematically uh, their, uh, uh, their brain with MRI lesions. Uh, I, want to, I want to point out to you that the most important timing of stroke is at the time of implantation. The, the crossing, uh, you know, all these things really doesn't matter. When you implant the uh, device, that is the most common time of having the stroke. There was a lot of, lot of debate about the fact that, oh, the stroke happens not at the time of the procedure, it happens seven days later, four days later, and maybe preventing the emboli prevention device may or may not help. So I want to clarify this part. So there are some strokes that, that we reported and others reported in the partner database from two to seven days. However, if you do a statistical analysis, this is with Gene Blackstone, to say that is there a risk of stroke, uh, a time variant, time covariate analysis, it shows that the stroke happens very, very early. Whatever, you, whatever way you cut it, it is very procedure related, at least statistically. There is no late, uh, late uh, hazard. If you look at this uncomplicated TAVR, just like how you saw, this is the same thing, just putting a valve, no complication, everything going smooth. Patient is extubated in the cath lab, doing well, neurologically intact. On the day two, because his LV function was poor, he gets a little bit of captopril, he drops his blood pressure, he cannot talk, he has hemiparesis, and uh, blood pressure comes out to 140, his uh, symptoms resolve. Did this stroke happen at the time of procedure, or did this stroke happen two days later? This is the question. And what we found, we did the uh, uh, CAT scan, we found a calcific embolus at the bifurcation of the middle cerebral artery. This calcific embolus most likely happened at the time of the procedure. However, the blood flow is normal. He was not symptomatic. He dropped the blood pressure or there is a thrombosis of the area. They develop symptoms. So the procedural event is, in my mind, extremely critical uh, in, this, uh, in the stroke, uh, stroke business. So when it happened, and so the pharmacotherapy alone is going to help or not is debatable, but it is important to know that maybe keeping them uh, uh, platelet inhibition and not giving them protamine or uh, keeping them some, giving them some anticoagulation for a brief period of time may be worthwhile. What are the risk factors? This is the partner analysis, 49 patients, very hard to do analysis because there were not that many strokes. That is a good thing. And if you look at the, the registry data, the most important part that is very commonly missed is the part that 10% of the patients have prior strokes. All these patients who are enrolled in the trial, 10% have prior strokes. So if you look at uh, these patients, if they have recurrent strokes, so we looked at our partner data, which will be published, only two patients develop stroke between the year two and three, and both of them have a 90% carotid stenosis. So this is not necessarily related to the TAVR, but related to other comorbidities in this group of patients. And in our meta-analysis, we have this table to say that what are the factors people found. Most commonly, people found uh, that if they have new onset atrial fibrillation is an important risk factor uh, for later strokes. Post-dilatation is another factor. Again, is it the post-dilatation or is the substrate is questionable. 
In the Canadian experience, they have a very nice uh, univariate and multivariate model of 30 days and one year stroke risk. And the 30 day learning curve, diabetes, balloon post dilatation, atrial fibrillation, and in the late part, chronic atrial fibrillation, PVD, cerebrovascular disease, and anticoagulation at the time of discharge were the most important uh, factors. New onset atrial fibrillation is very critical, uh, and new onset atrial fibrillation most commonly happens with a TATAVR, not with TFTAVR. I'll finish in the 30 sec uh, one minute. Uh, just to say that the, if you look at this new onset atrial fibrillation, this is the CHADVAS score. These are the TAVR patients. They have a very, very high CHADVAS score, and they also have a very high HESBLED score. So these are the patients who may benefit uh, from closing the left atrial appendage. Now there are, uh, there are two trials. The one trial that is happening in the United States, this is the CLARET trial uh, with the Sentinel trial, which is the CLARET device. This is going to kick off very soon. Uh, and uh, this, what this will replace is a good patient where we had to put two emboli protection devices and two balloons in the subclavian to prevent this very mobile echo density to dislodge before we put the valve. And how do we have to accomplish this? By putting eight sheets in four arteries, uh, which we will not have to do because this is a device that can go through a six French radial artery. Uh, so stroke prevention will help to move to the lower risk patients, and it may be advantage rather than disadvantage compared to SAVR. Uh, and that is, uh, again, I'm happy to take any questions.